Yes. Real pleasure. Likewise, Quite man. Quite stressing out. I mean, when I'm interviewing be people like yourself, it's always a challenge because you've answered everything already. <laughs> um, probably 10 times over, yeah. to be honest with you. Wonder, somewhere on the internet. The yeah, somewhere on the internet. I mean, when I'm doing my research, I was like, um, no, I'm not going to do this no more because I'm answering everything. There's no more questions to ask. I'm just going to have a conversation with you. Sure thing. Um, so before we, before we even get into some of my key questions, I really wanted to just discuss the album mm. with the nonogram. Yeah. Tell me about that. Walk me through the process of creating that. Um, it was an exciting project for me to pull together because very often it's sort of the music leading idea something exists in an incorporeal weird space in my head and then it comes from the nebulous to something real in the end with this i wanted to approach it purely from a conceptual framework first using numbers using frequencies using shapes to create sound and then letting that trigger the musical process the creative process how did afterwards. you do that man how did you do that it sounds like a bizarre yeah occurrence yeah how did you get yourself in i that? think it, 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 the genesis of it came about because I just finished The Legend of Mike Smith, which is all about the seven deadly sins. And it's really lyrically turgid as well. Like I tried to imbibe the idea of being envious or wrathful on each track, and that pushed me as a lyricist in lots of different ways. With this album, I wanted it to be more instrumental, more music, to just communicate those things that lyrics can't, you know? Um, so in terms of like using the maths, in the, the example of a song called Triangle on the album, it takes two central notes and if you take the internal angles of an equilateral triangle, 60 degrees, and play it as a frequency, 60 would be roughly F sharp, or B, B. And um, if you then add up all the external, uh, sorry, if you add up all the internal angles, then you get 180, and that would be an F sharp. So playing, if you like, the sound of a triangle, playing the interval relationships between the angles, internal and external, you start to get interesting sounds, effectively. You start to get, Unity and disunity, harmony and then harmony, you start to get discordance, you know, and 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 balance at the same time. And that's interesting. Deep. Mm. I mean, for the lay person who just appreciates your music, they're mm. probably not going to connect with that whole concept. And that excites me too, you know, okay. because I feel that there's a science to pop music often and the stuff we hear on the radio that just keeps us consuming. Agreed. You know, I mean, we just feel it. We don't know the science, but we sort of feel the effects of it. And like 100 BPMs per minute. Yeah, I don't know what it is, <laughs> but something that makes you go, I feel like a Mickey D's right now. I could really do with a cup of cola. So whatever the, the science of that is, we're unaware of it, but we're influenced by it. And I feel the same with this. It's just that people should feel a sense of balance without necessarily knowing what it is. Right. They feel the songs getting inside their head and want to hum them and repeat them, you know, like an earworm, but not necessarily understanding how that happened. Just feeling that their consciousnesses in some ways have been elevated they're in a different space to when they started how long did the process take you i would say probably a year from the inception of certain songs and certain beats i'd had in sketch form for for a, probably over three three years now but pulling the album together in focused terms like this probably about a year i want to read a quote um, from yourself mm -hmm. i am largely inspired by the numerical and sonic aspects of music that transcend cultural differences mm. You've taken the maths into cultural differences mm. now. Explain that for me. Mm. Great question. I think um, when I say transcend, I think also give us di a different perspective on what they are and how they've come about. Right. Um, we are in an age of division, like unquestionably, and there are camps within politics, within popular culture that are focused on accentuating that division and driving people apart. But whether you're black, green, orange, yellow, whatever language you speak, even if you don't speak an intelligible language, there are laws and principles in maths that will communicate with you. There's the sound of harmony and sound that transcends a lot of these a lot of these barriers. But even scratching beneath the surface, there are a lot of conditions that I think we as African descended people all around the world are facing. That finding metaphors within maths are fascinating for me. The number nine itself. The fact that it's in everything and yet invisible at the same time. I'll give you an example. If you add any number to nine, using the digital root system, it simultaneously disappears and is there at the same time. Five plus nine is 14, one plus four is five. The nine is gone. You know, any number you add to nine, that, that happens with. It's in all sorts of laws of angles and geometry, especially using the digital root system. Um, it's not often credited as such. Sounds like some people um, that you might um, want. Um. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, not, not to exclude anyone from yeah. that, that category. I think a lot of the songs that I started to explore that subject on I found myself talking about a common history between 
white working class uh, people in this country specifically yeah. and African uh, melanated people's history all around the world and the fact that you know we've often been pitted as enemies no more so than in our current media climate actually mm. oh who's going to talk about the underachievement of white working class boys or black lives matter black lives matter all lives matter yeah. white <laughs> lives matter <laughs> poor white matter. lives matter <laughs> purple <laughs> lives matter stop yeah. talking about black people yeah. you know yeah. all these aversions to talking about the subject that we all need and i think it's it's a matter of healing you know if i'm talking to a woman about the effects of misogyny it will probably make me a better man to understand how that works but we live in a culture where to start talking, just say the word black. And it's like, well, what, what do you say I'm angry about? What have you got against white? <laughs> it's like, this would be better for all of us if we start to look at these subjects from a, a, a different framework. And numbers and geometry is an example of that different framework. Uh, it's good that you're, you're bringing attention to this because I, I know that uh, a lot of people who are partly or, you know, even just some way invested in your music um, will be intrigued by it, but they'll share the information as well, which mm. is like what I think is kind of key. Great. People share music, mm. but they don't they often share the message. Mm -hmm. um, so it's, it's, it's great that you're doing that. Listen, you're, we're here at the Roundhouse, mm. um, not quite in the room that we expected to be in, but you know, corners are corner. Uh, <laughs> you performed there before. What's it mm. like? You know, is your music well received here? And where does this rank in terms of venues that you performed at? I'm sure you've, mm. you know. Probably got a few favourites that are a little bit grander than, than this space. Here. Than this cafe. Well, yeah. thankfully, we're not performing in the cafe. Well, yeah, we're like, <laughs> in the sackless space. In one booth, you get me? Yeah. <laughs> Gather around, audience. <laughs> but um, it's great. I think it's iconic, it's historical, much like Jazz Cafe around the corner um, where I had a residency with the Tomorrow's Warriors for like four years as well, playing there regularly. Camden is somewhere, it's an area that holds a special place for me. But. Um, I tend not to set necessarily see things in terms of prestige when I'm enjoying the playing process. It's great for an audience to know, but it's more about relationships and there's some great people who work in this building that I've been doing education projects with in Bromley, um, all over the city and it's building on those relationships that hopefully draw a new audience in as well to the kind of music I'm, I'm, I'm playing. But yeah, I've played some great places, man. I've played Dizzy's in New York, up, upstate. I've played grand festivals in Morocco, like the Ganawa Festival we had like some like 200,000 people out in the wow. streets coming to check That's it, amazing. so amazing. Played Montreal Jazz Festival, Montreal Jazz Festival. So it's been it's been a lot of fun, is man. Is there any way you'd like to perform that's not on your, is on your, is on your bucket list? Yeah, it's funny. We were just kind of looking earlier at some of my travels around the world. It's been interesting. I've been to Palestine, which is fascinating, in South Africa. Never really played a show in West Africa. I've been right. before. I would love to do the whole Kamasi, Ghana thing. I'd love to do Imini's Castle and... I feel like I need to do that as a sort of personal pilgrimage, but also there's a new audience, as all my West African friends are telling me, booming up from Gambia to Ghana, you know, Accra, Lagos is killing it right now from what I hear. So I need to, I need to be out there. Yeah. What about people that you work with? I've seen you've worked across the board. There's so many people that have endorsed you, um, advocated your music. Who would you like to work with though? If, there, if there's like a hit list, top three people that you would love to. Ooh, tricky. I should triangles with, as it were. That's one of those questions I should have the answer ready for all the time because I'm always scratching my head. Well, that, that, that suggests that you've worked with pretty much everybody you'd like to work <laughs> yeah, with. Yeah, right? there's <laughs> no one. No <laughs> one is good enough anymore. What well, uh, people answer that then? <laughs> what about people that are not here no more? Mm. I mean, that you would have if you oh, had man. the chance, like your Bob Marley's, your Houston's, whoever. Yeah. Who, who, yeah. Anybody on that list? Tosh. Um, <laughs> Jimi Hendrix. Mm. For Sheezy. Um, oof. Man, so I'd, I'd be interested to one. I wonder what Tupac would have sounded like now had he lived, you know, and heard what Kendrick was doing. Yeah, you know, Kendrick, he's still alive, he's still with us. I'd love to work with that dude. Kendrick, you listening, son? You, yeah, I hope you're tuning in, dog. Yeah, man, sure. I hear you on the TDE people, you kind of good. <laughs> um, man, I just, I, yeah, fella. Mm. I've, I've been lucky enough to play a couple of gigs with Shao and Kuti. The sun, which is incredible, you know. But yeah, to have worked with the master here, that would be magical. Um, you're lucky Indian, doobie. Right? I'm West, in West Indian, but as the name implies, I mean, it wasn't a name I gave myself. Very much Pan African minded parents, Pan African conscious parents, you know. So, I mean, that's what Grove was like when I was a toddler. It it's funny, you know. It was born in the, in the height of carnival, my friend. So height of carnival, real you know, carnival. Right there, there was real community. Yeah, and we also mash up police and everything. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> but, but seriously, in all seriousness, the idea of being, of having an African name, or, you know, a lot of my friends are Marcuses and Micahs, mm -hmm. biblical. Juniors. Juniors. Yeah. 
but there was a lot also of Omars and right. Omaris and a lot of appropriating an African history, sometimes a constructed one, but something that gave us an identity that wasn't the one being ho hoisted on us, you know. I think it's important to reclaim that. I was going to just ask you that, how important is that to you personally? It's huge because the framing in all these subjects, I, I go on about it, I rail about it, because if we're always defined as slaves, yeah. as opposed to enslaved Africans, as opposed to prisoners of war, um, it disempowers us in all sorts of ways. We forget that we had this rich history that came before this colonial contact. And we also run away from really looking at what slavery was about because of this, this collective shame about it. So framing the debate, the narrative in different ways, we're survivors, like we're here. And we have something to contribute to the world that has often just not been recognised, you know? Talk about contributions that ain't recognised. Obama walks out of the White House soon. Mm -hmm. You know, it's been an interesting eight years. Mm. It's been interesting, you know, for him to get the get the nod, get the support of the people. Mm. What are your thoughts on that whole Obama reign of presidency? Or, or, or I and, think it's what brilliant. Do you think now that mm. Mm. I don't hold too much hope out in regards to the political process changing these systemic racial yeah. problems because they've not shifted. And um, what what's fascinating to me is, yeah, he was elected to this this position, but we knew right at the time of it, I think most African Americans I spoke to, I was in New York in 2009 on Inauguration Day, were very realistic about his ability to actually affect change. He bucked up against the Senate, obviously, and bucked up against powerful opponents in Congress, and he's really struggled. Um, so what, what it showed to me, and at the time I think a lot of people were correctly cynical about it, was that, you know, they run the family business into the ground <laughs> run the, the household budget into the ground and like, yeah, call the black man, he'll come fix it. And how short memories are, you know, the, the country was on the brink of collapse, if not revolution, where Bush left it. Thanks to the Lehman Brothers. Yeah, Lehman Brothers, Fannie Mae, all of those toxic, toxic all of those phrases we don't even... Securitized, you know, triple-A uh, securitized loans that were... Yeah, yeah. yeah well, they've completely fallen out of discourse, public credit, discourse. Credit, credit ratings, triple-A credit ratings. And, and amazingly, they've been able to, I guess, blame 30 years of neoliberal free marketeering Capitalism. Capitalism and just a lack of care for people in general, be they working class or otherwise, very self-interested, tiny elite people. And they blame that whole 30 years, which we've had in this country too, of monetarism under Thatcher and continuing. They blamed it on one black dude, you know, or tried to blame it on one black dude. And it's worked for, a, I think, a groundswell of Trump supporters. But it's the elephant in the room. All these subjects, you know, the financial crisis. Oh, well, who are you giving these AAA securitized loans to? Oh, it's the black people again, the ones that you built this whole corrupt system on. You know, the number nines, if you want to call them that. Um, and until you deal with the systemic causes, they can start arresting policemen tomorrow for shooting black people, sure. But that won't cure the systemic issue, which is that they're making money off of black bodies, off of black labour. It's the engine that fuels the entire corrupt political and economic system. Hillary and Donald aren't going to cure it either, are they? No, they're not. But I think it's also important for us to take stock here in the West, you know. It's often easy to look at the pyrrhic achievements of black Americans and, oh yeah, Martin Luther King did great, so we don't have racism over here anymore. Or Hillary and, and Donald are terrible and <laughs> such a lack of candidates. It's a good job our politics is great. Of Oh, it's not. So we need to look at some of these these common common issues, yeah. you know. Closer to home then, Brexit. Mm. Were you for or against? I was definitely against Brexit, as for Remain, um, but I'd be foolhardy to say I don't recognise the reasons why people voted out. We've got a perception that we're great Britain, we're great, because we did great stuff. And this is also again about reframing, it's something I'm really passionate about. I was uh, discussing, stroke debating the issue with Andrew O'Neill on um, this week, like right at the start of the year. And for me this... Um, yeah, this this subject really is. It's, uh, let me just, look, yeah, form my you, thoughts yeah. a bit more. Like edit this out, perhaps. Because yeah. <laughs> when he was with Andrew, he's the kind of man that would probe. Because mm -hmm, mm -hmm. um, I find when he sits down with people, of, of, you know, black people that kind of have a sense in their head, mm -hmm. and he really wants to get a sense of where we are mm -hmm. um, and what we're thinking. Because I don't really think our views put forward with any kind of weight. No, we might have a view, and that's what they think, but. It's not really going to affect the agenda. It's not, and and it's often 
through, I guess, the initial guys is like, let's just have an open conversation about slavery, but it's or racism or whatever. But it's it's usually kind of how can we show statistically that these people haven't got anything to complain about anymore? And that was very quickly where you know the discussion went. But for me. And that was a train of thought that had this really important. I was struggling to connect to it. Coffee's not strong enough. Worry. Now we're leaving, though. Do you think we'll be better off? I, I struggle to believe. Time will tell. Time will definitely tell we'll be better off or not. I struggle to believe how, given the reasons that we left, which is about division, about immigration, they're taking our jobs, I, I think it's a pretext for things to only get worse yeah. and if Nissan has just happened now has, has been wooed by some secret carrot that nobody knows about is it tax is it tax avoidance are they going to turn Britain into the Cayman Islands now that we're denuded of European regulation is it human rights legislation where they don't have to watch their backs no more no, yeah. yeah I mean it's all closed doors isn't it it's all cloak and dagger so we don't know how this is actually going to manifest itself we don't, know what the agenda we don't know what the agenda is, but if these corporations are saying it's going to be wonderful while the workers don't know, I, I don't hold out much faith that it's going to result in us doing marvellously well as a result. Random question, so are, mm. are, you, um, are you a meat eater? Yeah, what I like What do you make of this vegan fad over here at the moment? I don't know, over here, gl- worldwide and this whole push to eat light food. I'm in two minds about it. What, so I think the raw food, so, quite possibly, oh, I'm in two minds about it because I think Having been to something called Zero Carbon Britain, right. where you look at the actual ecological, environmental impact of the way we grow meat. Mm. It's not the principle of eating meat, it's the labour-intensive, agri-business nature of it. Biggest Anyone who's seen Cowspiracy told you that. 600, 6,000 times the emissions of cars and airplanes. Mm. So it's kind of hard to morally justify just wanting to eat steak, you know. <laughs> but by the same token, the way that people are getting on this bandwagon yeah. speaks to me about the cognitive dissonance in our culture. It's like... There's so much genuine sexism, racism, inequality happening that if I just don't eat meat and I'll feel better about myself and change my Facebook profile flag to Belgium or France or something like that, or rainbow, just to show I'm a nice person, these are sometimes quite superficial ways of, of avoiding this cognitive dissonance that we all feel, wanting to be good people but know we're living in this really fundamentally messed up society. You're, um your build is the man. I really want to remember what the hell I was going to say about Brexit. Don't worry, cool, 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 cool. Your build is the, the, the brains behind the Birmingham flyover. Mm. That's a big moniker to have, my friend. Yeah, well, thank you. That, 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 that flyover was needed. Yeah, man. Um, why are you built just the brains behind it? So, for, for those who don't know. Um, it actually, interestingly, ties into the whole nature of the Andrew Neil conversation right. and things like this. Um, I was listening to Nate Parker, this is a very indirect way of answering yeah, the question, yeah. talking about the exceptionalization of, of gifted or talented or successful black people. You've made a film, you've done all right, you shouldn't complain about racism or anything like that. I've been to Oxford, I've sold albums, I've toured the world, why am I whinging about inequality and racial disparity and blah, blah, blah. Um, and for me, it was important to contextualize myself within the history, a, a very rich history of black British musical expression. And to be unashamed of that, not to say this is a confrontational thing, but I don't just come out of thin air. Like Steel Pulse is founded, one of the founder members of Steel Pulse lived on the same street as me growing up. Julie Dexter lived just down the road. She's in Atlanta making all sorts of music now. Um, Birmingham alone has this rich heritage and many of them were there at the flyover this year. Black Symbol, uh, you know, rest in peace, Andy Hamilton. I come from this rich heritage. And that strengthens me. This isn't all altruism. Like I know how much more power that gives me to say I grew up in Labour Grove. As I was there in the background, you know what I mean? I grew up around Courtney Pine and Steve Williamson. Because what the media and the industry likes to do is to extrude, to extract people and say, look, everything's okay. There's no problem here. And I, I want to say, actually, nah. All the people that gave me my startup, that level of consciousness and the musical desire to, to excel have come from communities and places that aren't often recognized by the mainstream um, and it's very important again for me to say to younger musicians and artists coming up this is this is the methods these are the means this is how you can replicate success no one's going to give it to you you know be you poor white black from any background this kind of deferential attitude that we've got in the music industry i sound great in my bedroom so someone's going to find me no, we've got to find ourselves within our communities and, and find a way of, of sharing that with the world. Really important you saying that, and I'm going to get back to, you know, younger generation and how you see that, you know, evolving and coming up behind you, mm. off of the back of your success, but still on the subject of, of Brum, mm. has that changed for you since the turn of the, 
century. <laughs> you know, let's go back. 16 let's go back. 16 years. Yeah. Yeah. All the way let's back then. Look. Yeah, I mean, because these millennials are not going to appreciate mm. the journey, but you can. I mean, how's it, how's it changed and how's that changed positive? Um, it's changed in a multiplicity of ways. There's been some positive and some negative right. change. I think when I first started getting into jazz, there were quite a few live music venues to play. And then it was a real dark period in the beginning of the noughties where Ronnie Scott's closed down and became a strip club. The Fiddle and Bone stopped doing live music. And there was a real dearth of opportunities to play live music. And I stepped in in that period to, to try and start doing things like live box jam sessions and the Flyover Show, which is still happening now. Um, I think there's been a lot of development. Uh, the old concrete ball ring came down and a new glass concrete one went up. And pretty, pretty. Pretty, you know, it's uh, developed retail and luxury apartment culture like we've seen up and down the country. But this has often been at the expense of genuine grassroots cultural evolution. And what I think Birmingham has that London struggled with is it's hold on, held on to some autonomous communities. You know, that's meant that often we're not integrated. You have ghettos, you know, Alan Rock's very Muslim. Uh, Hansworth is now more Eastern European, but was very black. And communities don't necessarily integrate. But one thing is, man, I, I like being able to know where I can get a curry patty from and <laughs> curry goat and it some matters. groceries. It does, it, it does. And that sense of community is something that we've retained. It's also getting quicker and quicker to get to and from London. It's got to be a positive thing. Yeah, yeah and get out of London. <laughs> I love London, but I feel like they stole my city from me. I mean, I For went real? to nursery. You feel, you feel like yeah, I went to nursery in Kensal Green, Lambert yeah. Grove. I went to primary school, Oxford Gardens and uh, South London and, and all over the place. And these areas now, from Wandsworth to Brixton, where my mum now lives, would be impossible for me to move into, even as a successful musician, to, to be able to buy a property in some of these places. You got one bedroom flat selling for a million quid in wow. Brixton, yeah. when 15 years ago, these people wouldn't have stepped a foot in these areas. Did, 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 didn't we miss a trick, bro? Yeah, why, we always do. And I've got aunt, an aunt in bed in Brooklyn, where it's the exact same phenomenon. Well, same we move in, we uh, build up an area that had been destroyed by the war, or oh, this white flight, whatever the, the reasons. We develop cultural capital because it now becomes cool to go to a mangrove or a dub vendor or a dog bridge. star, the fridge, okay. so enough of these places. Um, and then just money, you know, it's like we get refracted, sent to other parts of the, the country and don't have that autonomy. That means that you can, you can have the sort of cultural traction that Balti has in Birmingham, Golders Green, um, Southall, other parts, uh, other communities. Sad state of affairs. Yeah, but it's not all doom and gloom. No, because we can now make those opportunities wherever London will keep growing. Absolutely. Um, not as quick as, as it did post or pre Brexit. I, I think for us, as again African descended people, is it's about identifying where our, our futures lay and redefining the narrative again so we're not reacting to circumstances. Oh, they've moved us out of Peckham, where are we going to go? Oh, they're shooting us on the streets, what are we going to do? It's like having an agenda having a vision of ourselves as fully British, as fully black, um, and, and being congruent with those identities. You mentioned the youngsters um, earlier on. If I was a young, aspiring saxophonist, rapper, all the monikers, mm -hmm. fly under, mm -hmm. um, I'd be looking at your journey as, as a template for success. You know, um, is it important for you to kind of provide that for that next generation? Hugely. And how, how in your way are you sending the lift back down? Um, it's hugely important for me because, uh, particularly as a jazz musician, the examples that I had around me showed me something very different to the, the, the dominant culture in the music industry, inverted commas. I met Winston Marsalis when I was 13. Dude, at yeah, the end of his concert, takes me and another 13-year-old drummer to one side and he's just asking us questions about jazz and we're playing some piano and... I just felt like a baton being passed on and we're still friends to this day, you know. Um, you know, Courtney Pine brought me around to the house, gave me a mouthpiece, Reeds, Steve Williamson and I, you know, people I looked up to from afar brought me into this thing called jazz and then were like, this is how you do it. Gary Crosby, Denise Baptiste, um, Jason Yard, you know, peers and those directly before me passing the baton on. So it would be remiss of me to not do the same. And you also learn something in the process of, of teaching, learning that we can imbibe lessons from, not to sound too cryptic, but from our ancestors that aren't necessarily given to us in the mainstream. They're not like, oh, 
this is how you become a wonderfully signed, tremendously successful musician. That's not it. This is the craft. This is the art. You know, the, these are the voices of people who built on traditions and traditions to, to produce excellence, and it's our duty to continue to do that. Are you, are you actively doing it, or is it something you find that you may do? I'm very much actively doing it, and it's a huge, just, huge thing behind the flyover show. Right. If you looked at the roster this year, we had Ernest Ranglin and Eskimo Tsinguazi, who are two internationally uh, credited and recognised and huge artists, but then the entire rest of the bill was Birmingham-based artists, some of whom are established, right. some of whom are up, up, coming, up and coming. And uh, for one of them, I remember J. Dot Sosa saying, when he saw Wordsworth perform, come from New York, and perform a freestyle at the Fly of a Show like four years ago. He got in his pen game. He was like, I'm inspired, I need to write. And he performed this year. And I'm sure there's some teenager we don't know about who was in the crowd who Similarly. clocked it and was like, okay, it's bars, it's spitting, but there's live instruments there as well. Maybe I should talk to some piano players. Maybe I should get on my mojo and practice an instrument. People seeing connections and synergies there that, again, aren't necessarily publicized. That is the point of the Fly of a Show. It's this derelict corner of Birmingham that nobody particularly cares about. Only makes the news when um, people do something bad. Yeah. And I've noticed how, probably since 2011, the words black and gang have been interchangeable, which disgusts me. We've got this really rich, rich culture. And any time there's a black subject, so-and-so from the gang rehabilitation organization is on the news as in a, about it. It's like, what's that got to do with black? It's criminalization that's been foisted on us again for a very long time and we need to escape that narrative and frame, I think you thank you work. thank you I'm with right. you I'm with you saxophonist band leader composer rapper radio presenter do you sleep? <laughs> <laughs> I'll sleep when I'm dead um no I, I like to keep active basically and it's also all these things are connected in lots of different ways I feel that being a radio presenter with this new show on BBC Radio 3 facilitates me talking to musicians in a different way. Like a lot of these cats, Robert Glasper, Shabaka, I mean, growing up playing saxophone together and yeah. I can talk to them any time. But this context gives me a, a way to kind of get into their process and unlock that for other people. And I'm learning things about my own practice and process of composition uh, and learning other methods and approaches from people like Tor Gustafsson and Scandinavian musicians that I wouldn't necessarily have checked on my own volition. But, this is bringing me into the, the wider world of jazz and I'm enjoying it. Then I'm, you know, finding new artists that I can program for flyover shows up and down the country. I'm using things for my theatre practice. Um, there's a play version of my last album, The Legend of Mike Smith, which is going to be opening in Hackney early next year. So I'm learning every single time these apparently disparate things are happening. I'm learning things that make me a more cohesive uh, and competent artist. So what does it look like for the next... I was going to say the next five years, but you're so busy, I'm going to say the next 12 months. What does it look like? <laughs> I'm um, just trying to get through it one day at a time. But I'm really excited about, again, a lot of things coming together. You know, people have probably seen my Twitter timeline uh, uh, for the past six months since Brexit. And one of the offshoots of that, and the conversations I've been having with people in Momentum and stuff as well, is I'm going to be supporting Jeremy Corbyn, a charity fundraiser in Brighton. He's my hero, man. I ain't going to lie. He's, listen, he's a spank. Don, he's a Don Dada. Standard. He come under attack this attack year. Attack this I year, and he stood up yeah. like simmer up. Yeah. Bad boy. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, I'm Took all the here. shots. Took the shots. Duck them. Duck them. Was like <laughs> <laughs> backhanded some of the shots. And yeah, I was, yeah. I'm I, tremendously impressed. Wonder, why, why he won't come under the level of attack that he did, but... I'm pretty clear on some of the reasons he has, yeah. and that's part of the epiphany that I think we all need to go through. There's lots of reasons why I'm personally drawn to him, but one that's relevant here is that he talks about being politicised when he went to Jamaica yeah. and uh, organising a speech with Walter Rodney, and this was like, bing, bing, bing. Mm -hmm. So the emancipation of African peoples all around the world fired a switch in his head, which is like, humans everywhere can get on with this message. I think that's what Britain needs to learn, as opposed to having anxieties about race relations and the past of slavery and guilt about it. It's like, this is how we can all become better humans. And that seems to be somebody lifelong who signed up for that. Fighting apartheid, you know, the Iraq war, women's representation. You look at his voting record and you're like, this dude is a dud. He's, he's done it. Career in politics then? Uh, possibly, I don't know. I'm very suspicious of the whole the whole process. Politics. And this is the politics. And this is the reason why he's come up to the second part of the point, why he's come up to such virile hostility, such strong, you know, derision. Because having read a book by Martin Williams called Parliament Limited, you realise our entire system is compromised. Lobbying groups, um, second jobs, we're talking like 
a lot of these ministers are on um, board of directors of companies and they don't have to declare them because of the Companies Act of 2006. BAE Systems, Lockheed, uh, Boeing, all these great companies that manufacture instruments of death around the world. We've eclipsed uh, China and Russia to become the second largest exporter of arms around the world. And along comes somebody who's, the only people who bankroll him are Stop the War Coalition. You know, his only expenses are, are minimal. It's like almost double, literally just 10 quid or something a year for his expenses. And he's hitting this sclerotic institution called the Houses of Parliament where they're all on the make. The one thing that both sides of the house can agree on is that 87% of them are private landlords. They have interests in private finance. And it's very difficult for anyone to speak out against that because you'll just be marginalised. And you also see the, the media colluding in it as well. So for the first time, it's a breath of fresh air. Most people who support him can just see how... It's offering how, a new type of it's politics. It's a new part of politics, a new type of, new way of doing things that isn't about who's speaking behind you, who are you speaking on behalf of. It's actually speaking on behalf of people that vote, uh, 300,000 membership support and 600,000 people within the membership. It's huge and it, it's a sea change. And I, I just wish we'd get behind it because many, many years we've all been just like, oh, the Illuminati are doing this. and you know, these private interest groups, and it leaves us feeling really disempowered. And, and, and this is completely different, and I'm all, I'm all for it. Well, listen, you're going to be promoting your album, mm. uh, Nonogram, for the foreseeable. Mm. Do you get to enjoy Christmas? Do you take a break? Do you have downtime? What sort can of I just remember the point I was going to make about... Uh, yeah, you yeah, can, yeah. I, I was going to get back to you. Cool, cool. Got it, yeah? I got it, <laughs> right, I got it, I got it. Very interesting things happen around race identity right. with, with yeah. Brexit for yeah. me. And people that I grew up with, went to nursery with, and the likes of Kensal Green or Handsworth, many of them white, uh, and not the private school, but the state schools, were sort of third generation immigrants like me, you know, Irish often, Polish, Romanian. I had a crush on this Romanian girl like, when I was seven years old, but she was cockney. Um, <laughs> one of my mates at primary school in Oxford Gardens was a Kurdish refugee. So he's like 35 now. He spent <laughs> his entire life virtually in England. So marketing these things as new challenges for me was part of the delusion, the deception that helped to create a Brexit. Um, and particularly large groups of white working class people essentializing this notion, this, this notion of whiteness as, as something pure that, that bonded them to people in Berkshire and Hertfordshire against the foreigners, against asylum seekers. It's very pernicious and it's a lie. And you look historically, anytime poor people look like they're getting together, the extreme right or some political you know, intrusion stops that from happening. There was a great film Don Let's just made about Skinhead recently on, on iPlayer, Wicked. And it just shows you, this is how Skinhead happened. Poor white kids getting into Jamaican culture, wanting to be a bit black, shaving their heads, wearing drain pipe trousers and that, and creating this new hybrid culture. And people go, ooh, this is powerful. We can use this to create to sow division and hatred. And then you have these bizarre spectacles of booking two-tone ska bands to play and half the audience zig highland them at the front of the, the crowd like what's going on there madness and that's where we are now like these people who grew up loving ragga loving hip-hop being part of this hybrid inner city urban culture now being you know drawn off and picked off against each other and as a historian i did history at oxford this story has gone back to the 18th century when you had black agitators on the streets of london back then saying it's not even about race, it's not even about slavery, this is about money. And if we get together and change the system, we'll all be better off for it. Um, you know, when, when, when do you break, when do you chill, when do you have downtime, when do you assess how, you know, how much of an impact this nonogram has made? Yeah, it's a good you question. Know, and, you know, you go again, on, or how does, that, how does that work? I'm going to be hitting South Africa for like three weeks or so over Christmas. Right. That's like my war plug, you know. I love this country and I think I feel most patriotic when I discover people like Jeremy Corbyn. Like he couldn't exist in any other country, you know, excitedly eccentric woodwork teacher someone <laughs> described him as like, I love the dude. And it makes me patriotic that this country can produce people like that. But the, the intensity of inequality, the intensity of sort of subliminal racial madness that's going on just makes me need an escape often. I need to plug myself into the wall, charger and 
you know, re re energize myself. Re, so that's where I'll be. I'll be in South Africa doing that with some friends and family yeah, over Christmas. Joe Burb, Durban. Um, they haven't got the Commonwealth Games. That's wicked. Years, yeah, man. that's right. That's right. Yeah, that's a good look. Good yeah. look for them. Are they ready? The area? Is it, I haven't been. Uh, yeah, yeah, man. And it's, it faces the many of the same challenges we face here. Yeah. Um, yeah. Globalization, yeah. global capital, yeah. facing the challenges of black people being allowed to work yeah. together yeah. in, in a superstructure. Zoom was under pressure. Anyway. Zoom was under pressure, but the whole country is often under pressure. Yeah. Uh, willing buyer, willing seller didn't work with land redistribution. We've got. Uh, issues with big corporations fulfilling their quotas of black employees, but never they're never hitting the board level. They're just there, you know, making the place look apparently more racially balanced. So, systemic versus superficial change seems to be a problem all around the world. I said that was my last question, but it's not. Mm. Married? Kids? Uh, not yet. Working on it. Yeah? Yeah. Are you? Yeah. Do you like, like that, the big family, the... The big I think it's probably one of them, when I start, I'm probably just going to start breeding and not stop. <laughs> so I'm like 50, it's come with a tribe of so finches. So anybody's spoken. Yeah, but just breed up, breed up, oh man. Yeah. Not for man, just breed them. Yeah. No, I'm joking, I'm joking. Um, yeah, future. yeah, it's, future. Future. it's definitely a future thing and I, I, I want to be as productive as I can be mm. now. I can just, imagine as a, as a father, you'd have so much to give back to. Yeah. Yeah, it's uh, maybe so little time to do all the other stuff I'm doing as well. Oh, what's the but one, having what's seen the example of my dad, yeah. you know, he yeah. brought me along to rehearsals. That was hugely formative for right. me. He's never been rich at all, but been yeah. very active, very well, successful. He was rich in Culturally exactly. wealthy. There you go. It's got tremendous so much value you placed on that. Exactly, and the, so. the people I had a chance to meet and, and grow up around made me the person I am now. So I'd like to Im Im impart that to some other little ones at some point in the future. Well, listen, man, it's been a pleasure talking to you. Thanks for your time. Thank I know you, you got a busy day ahead. Respect. Um, no, that we'll catch up soon. And all the best for the album and future Thank success. You. Follow me on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram. All of that. Buy my album. It's all, hot. All of that. It's, it's, it's buzzing. It's flying off the shelves. Peace. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.